Hello everybody, we're here today, you're watching Yurikoze on YouTube, and we're here today to talk about uh, David Coffin, who you see there, and Scott Davis, who you see there, and also the dishonest nature of Megan Bruton, who you saw there. This is a, a wholly circumstantial case that hinges on the fact that Megan manipulated the situation, and Scott may very well be innocent. So we're going to go over some of those things here today, and in videos to come. Hello everybody, how you doing? This is part two of the video about Miss Ross, the DA, the district attorney that prosecuted Scott Davis. Okay, so here we are with part two. Something else I want to mention here is the fact that in this case, 72 pieces of evidence were lost, which you'll hear about later, but anyway, 72 pieces. The district attorney in this kind of really took a very interesting... Um, <laughs> Put a very interesting spin on that i'll tell you basically coming into court in the eight nine years after the fact and they don't have the evidence and trying to say and basically just saying along the lines of oh well poor us we it got lost and now that makes us look bad playing for pity i mean seriously playing for pity uh, it's it's just despicable it's absolutely despicable it's the fact of the matter is is that this case only worked this prosecution only worked because they waited nine years nine years later oh yeah the evidence got lost over the last nine years okay people can buy that people just buy that and be like okay fine oh yeah nine years okay no big deal but no it is a big deal you know it's a huge deal and it and it, it's also a huge mistake by by Scott's pre previous lawyers, his previous lawyers back in '96 when when they originally were considering charging him but didn't, his lawyers at that point in time should have subpoenaed the fingerprints, the blood swab, and any anything other any other things that they think that that they thought they could you know that would you know that they could use because had they done that then they would have had results from that stuff that they could have ended up using later when all the evidence was lost and they had no way to test any of it to protect Scott or to defend him. So, so it's just another interesting fact of the fact that number one, all the evidence is lost, but then the prosecution actually uses it to their advantage by saying, Oh, Oh, poor us. We lost it. That looks bad on us. <laughs> Obviously not enough is all I got to say about that. So we'll move into where we were, where we left off before, where I was talking about the fact that the jury was out for four days, and uh, and just how really really difficult it was to get this conviction in the first place, uh, and like I said, it was this hard for to get it one against Scott. They knew there was no way they could try to prosecute Megan on this. If you still are not, you know, fully seeing it, maybe. Okay, well, that's fine. Let's look at this for a second. Who is Miss Ross? Where, you know, what's her story? Well, in 2005, she came into the Fulton County DA's office, I imagine as a young, you know, upwardly mobile young lawyer uh, who, was put in, who was put in charge of that, you know, the DA, Fulton, the Fulton County DA's office's cold case unit that they had just developed so she was put in charge of it you know first probably you know her first feather in her cap she's probably been working for a while to get that kind of an opportunity sure absolutely she goes into her cold cases and what's the first case that she pulls out what's the very first case that that she pulls out it's a case involving the victim who has a very rich and powerful father. And she sees it as a case that she can dig into and if she can bring somebody, if she can get a conviction on that case, she knows that Mr. Coffin Sr. would be very appreciative of that. And as an upwardly mobile thinking lawyer, I think that it occurred to her. I think she wanted to give David Coffin Sr what he wanted. Whether she agreed with him or not is irrelevant. I think that 
she just wanted to do this because she figured if if she gave if she gave them closure, which I don't know that you can call it closure because it doesn't work. The the narrative is really really wacky. Um. But if she could bring them a conviction, that would be enough for them. And then they, and then she, you know, so that's, I think, what she was thinking, you know, because it's the first case she picks out. She goes in there. She doesn't look for, you know, something where uh, um, it, that involved, you know, somebody that was maybe not so wealthy, that had less privileges in life and, you know, try to find justice for somebody like that. No, she immediately goes to a case that involved two wealthy families and you know yeah so i mean i'm just saying for that to be the first case that she picked is kind of telling to me and then you got to consider some of the things that she said in regards to this case so let's go ahead and see that now the renewed investigation lasts for nearly a year but produces little new evidence still ross pushes forward with the case she swoops in and picks us up and said, let's go. We're going to drive it like we stole it. So that was David's brother. That was David Coffin's brother saying that, that that's what she came in and said. That's an interesting choice of words. Drive it like we stole it. You know, think what you like of it, but it, it tells me it tells me she came in with a with a cavalier attitude. Which suggests that she may have been playing kind of loose with the rules, you know, or at least the the standards of being a prosecutor. Because I find that I find that wording a bit disturbing, me personally. So now we're going to move into another point about this case, and we're going to be hearing from Megan here. This is going to be Megan's words. This is something that Megan said on the TV show that I think I think it's something that she is very concerned about. Something that she worries about. And I think that when she says this, that there's actually a, a, a subtle under meaning that, that I just think that what she really means is that the case doesn't fall apart without Miss Ross connecting it the way she did. The case points at Megan without Miss Ross connecting the dots and prosecuting it the way she did. But anyways, I'll let you see the clip here and we'll come on back. She was the first person that actually got the case because it's a really tricky case. There's really fine timelines. And if you don't connect those dots perfectly, the case falls apart. So, so to my mind, what Megan really means there is that if Sheila Ross doesn't come in and prosecute this way, the way that Sheila Ross does, then it points at Megan. And Megan doesn't like that. She don't want that. So that's going to bring me to my final point here. Okay? The thing is about this is that the only real reason that this case ever got prosecuted, ever that it ever even got brought to court, is because the Coffin family was hurting. And, and, I, and I understand that. And I sympathize with that. But it was because they were hurting that a young kind of go get him, go get him attitude DA in the DA's office who has just been put in charge of this cold crime, cold case unit digs through the files, and pretty much the first case she picks out is this one. Like I said, to me it just shows a kind of a mode of thinking. Okay? Here's the thing. Miss Ross knows. She knows it. And trust me, I guarantee she's 100% correct. If she tries to go after Megan on this, especially eight years later, in 2005, nine years later, no way in hell a jury is going gonna, is gonna to come back with a guilty verdict for a woman. That, think what you may of it, but juries will generally tend to require a lot more evidence when it comes to women. They require a lot more substance. And that's just the honest truth of it. And Miss Ross knew this. 
So Miss Ross knew because the investigation was so bad, so crappy, and not enough things were looked into to for her to be able to look and try to actually go after a more <laughs> plausible suspect. Because like I told you, Chambers went from a evidence-driven investigation to a suspect-driven investigation in just a couple hours. That closed off so many avenues. So much information was not collected. So here's Ross wanting to wanting to do something, you know, to to bring, you know, somebody to conviction on this case, but she's looking later and she's realizing that the the investigation was really poor. It only looked in one direction, only collected information on Scott, and when she looks at that, she knows. I know she knows. She knows that me she knew, she's she's seen the report that Craig Foster uh, basically admits that he heard Megan saying that that David had been shot in the head or that David had been shot on the phone to Scott at 12:18. He told Chambers that night. He 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 said it in another police interview after that. He even said it in pretrial. Okay? It is beyond it is beyond. She knew. She knew that it was there and she had to hide that. She had to somehow hide that or obfuscate it, cloud it, just whatever she could, whatever she could do to just try to make it, you know, to confuse it. To essentially, that's it. To confuse that issue and to confuse that issue with the jury. And then she felt she had a chance to make this conviction float and she barely floated it over. Barely. I'm telling you. The jury was out for four days. The jury really was just not sure about this. I mean, the, the fact that they took so long really, really attests to that fact. So, when it comes down to it in the end, Scott Davis got convicted because he was a man. And it was therefore easier to pin a circumstantial case on him as a man than it would have been able to actually pursue the circumstantial case against Megan, who was actually the one who possessed the guilty knowledge. And I know that the DA's office, they all knew. They all knew. They tried to pretend at trial like, oh, we don't know, but they knew. They saw the same documents. They heard. They saw the same statements. There's no way. It's, Chambers knew that night. I, I cannot. I cannot punctuate this enough. Chambers knew that night. Craig Foster, David's friend, told him that night at the police station. Yes, I heard Megan say that to Scott on the phone around 12:18. Okay, and yet that's what I'm talking about. Willful ignorance, people. Chambers moves forward with his willful ignorance, just acting like that. That never happened. Nope. Scott was the one that did it. He that's the why he has the guilty information cuz he did it. Uh what about the fact that Megan told Megan told him? You can try to deny that, but it's the facts at this point. So There's going to be more videos obviously. We're going to be doing one on Chambers. We're going to be doing one, possibly two on Megan. Going through a lot of the things with her. I mean, and there's a lot. There's a lot with Megan. You know, the star the star witness the the one that was told not to talk about the case and for all during all five days that she was testifying was getting out of court at the end of the day and going on a crime vlog the most popular crime blog at at, at that point in time we're going to be doing that and then we're going to probably do be de dedicating a video to each one of the important days which is going to be saturday the 7th monday the 9th and tuesday the 10th so that's what's coming in terms of scott davis um and with, from from me here, Eric Jose on my channel, and uh, so that's that's about it for this video, everybody. I mean, just wanted to call into you know call everybody's attention to the very suspect way that this case was prosecuted. It seems very obvious to me, and as I said, I showed you in Mrs. Ross's own words that she did not meet her burden. So I'll leave it at that, folks. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe, and we'll see you later.